Just because you do the right thing doesn't mean other people won't do the wrong thing. And your responsibility is to do the right thing before God. Your responsibility is not to go, God, I've walked this out and I don't think this will work. Your responsibility is to say, God, you said it, I'm gonna do it, that settles it. God, I've heard your word loud and clear and I'm marching forward because my assignment is not from people, my assignment is from heaven. I'm so glad we're together in church today. We're continuing in our series, Power Today, through the book of Acts. This is part 49 in Power Today, and we're in chapter 21. So if you've got your Bible, I would encourage you to grab it. I hope you're taking notes. If you aren't or if you don't have a pen with you, the notes are on the James River app. I encourage you to download it. But I have a question for you as we get started into the passage today, and that question is this. Who remembers getting your first speeding ticket. Just raise your hand wherever you're out in the room. Now look around for all the people who don't have their hands up. Those are the people with really low insurance rates. Um, (laughs) But I remember to my great, uh, well, sadness, my first speeding ticket. I was 17 years old and I will tell you, I was absolutely devastated. I was devastated. And um, I actually like, after work. I asked my parents, I worked at a Texaco gas station. I asked my parents to come and meet me at work. Like, I don't know if I was wanting cover fire from the other, like, you know, people at the gas station. They didn't help me at all. Um, But I I told them, you know, I I got a ticket. And and so my dad suggested, he said, hey, you know, you're going to need to, you're going to need to you know, not only drive safer, but there's a family friend who's an attorney, and I think they'd be willing to represent you. And so I called them, and I talked to him, and he said, here's what I'll do for you. Let's do a little trade here. I'll represent you, but I want you to work a couple of weeks at the law firm, and you'll learn a little bit about the law, and then I'll represent you in court for the ticket. And I was like, that's amazing. Thank you so much. So uh, about a week and a half later, I ironed my dockers and my button-down shirt, trying to look my 17-year-old lawyerly best, and uh, hopped in the car and drove to the law office. And as I was exiting the highway, pulled onto the exit, I was in the right-hand turn lane, and I slowed down, and I looked to the right, and I looked to the left, and I looked to the right, and I looked to the left, and then BAM! And it wasn't the car behind me that hit me. It was me hitting the car in front of me. And I was thinking, okay, whew. A week and a half ago, I got my first ticket. Today, I'm in my first accident on the way to pay off my first ticket. This is not going well. So um, that wasn't the end, though, because here I am all gussied up, Dapper Dan, in my Dockers and button-down shirt, and the guys who get out of the car are not like that. Um, they are really large, they're tatted up, they look intense, um, and I was just thinking, oh, Lord Jesus, you have to help me right now. You just have to help me. But I knew you can't just stay in the car. I don't want them coming to me. I need to go to them. Like, I need to project strength, confidence. So they're standing at the back of the car, and I, I walk up, and I don't say anything. Not a word. I'm just staring at the, at the bumper of the car. And one of them, the, the driver, all of a sudden breaks the silence and he says, dude, I am so sorry I hit you. And I had a decision to make in that moment. Do I correct him? And I chose, much to my shame, to stay completely silent. I didn't say one word, but his buddy fixed it. He said, you moron, he hit you. (laughs) This is a true story. (laughs) It's a true story. Once again, I stayed completely silent. I just thought, project strength, project strength, project strength. So I'm just standing there, and he goes, well, you know what? I think it's so cool that you stopped. He's like, usually when I hit people, I just drive off. He said, so why don't we call it good? And they left. And I said, thank you. So that, uh, that's my first accident, everybody. That's how it went. Things went from bad to worse until they got better. 
And some of you know how that is. Like you, uh, you had a situation and it didn't go the way you hoped it would go. Like maybe it wasn't your first ticket turning into your first accident, but there was something and it just, you know, everything was going right until everything started going wrong. Sometimes it's the fact that you were trying to do the right thing. You're trying to make the good decision. Maybe you even did make the good decision and yet you were completely and totally misunderstood. People maligned you. People said things that weren't true about you. Like it just, it just kind of seemed to spiral out of control. Maybe even some of you are in a situation where that's how it's playing out in your walk with God right now. You're in a classroom, you're on a campus, you're in a neighborhood, you're in a workplace, and you're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to stand for Jesus. You're trying to walk with Him. You're trying to make decisions that honor Him. But it just seems like turn after turn with that family member, that friend, those coworkers, every time you try to stand up and walk with Jesus, you're misunderstood. Well, today we're going to Acts chapter 21, and we're going to look at some verses. And as we walk through these verses, I'm going to make some observations about what we see in this story, because it's a fascinating story. But in this story, what we're going to watch is how the Apostle Paul handled being misunderstood, because he is gravely misunderstood. And it seems as you walk through the text that things just keep going worse and worse and worse and worse. And the question is, how do you respond when you're misunderstood for doing good? How do you respond? Let's look at it in verse 17. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly on the following day. Paul went with, in with us to James. So Luke is the, the author, the writer of Acts under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's traveling with Paul. They go in to see James. James is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And so you could just kind of like Pastor James over all the other pastors in that area. They go in to see James and all the elders were present. And after gathering them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. So the passage starts on a very, very positive note. You know what? Paul comes into Jerusalem, even though he has heard from the Holy Spirit, things are going to be rough here. Everything seems to be going well. In fact, he, as he's talking to the elders, he gets right down to business, and I want you to notice what he does first, because Paul's first order of business is very instructive for us. He starts by sharing testimonies. Isn't that interesting? He starts, he greeted them, and then he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles. In other words, this isn't just a quick, praise God, let's move on. No, Paul actually shares story by story. He probably told them about Eutychus falling out of the window and that he had to raise him from the dead. And they might have said, well, we're surprised that doesn't happen more often with the way you preach, Paul. Like, I don't know. It was probably a little friendly exchange. But Paul is sharing the things that God has done one by one. Can I tell you this? That it's biblical and it's vital that we share the stories of what God is doing among us. That when we take time to do what we just did at the front of service and we say, you know what, you need to know that Jared was healed and John was healed and you need to know that Mary was healed and you need to know that Ireland was healed. When we're sharing those stories, we're doing something that the example was set for in the pages of Scripture. Sharing stories is so important. Getting specific one by one with what God is doing matters. It's important. It's vital. This is how Paul starts his time. And yet, I think if you picture that room, Paul is talking and yet he can see, perhaps out of the corner of his eye or in the expression of the people he's talking to, that all is not well in the room. He can sense that there's another shoe that's going to drop. Have you ever been in an interaction like that? You're telling a story, but you can tell they're thinking about something they're going to need to say to you after you tell the story. That's what's happening here. And so Paul finishes, they glorify God, the appropriate response. God's doing miracles. God's saving people. That's awesome. Then we go to verse 20. The end of verse 20, it said, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. So this couple of things to note here. One, this word for thousands is not the traditional Greek word for thousands. It's actually a word that is literally translated tens of thousands. 
What, what is, James is saying here is that the church in Jerusalem has absolutely exploded. Tens of thousands of believer, uh, believers belong to this church. God is saving people in droves. It's awesome. The church is massive. It's tens of thousands of believers, and they're Jewish people who have come to faith in Christ. But listen to what James says. They are all zealous for the law, and they've been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. In other words, Paul, the word on the street about you is, is not good. And you need to understand that Jerusalem, this is roughly AD 57, and Jerusalem is, is a tinderbox. I mean, it's just, there's a lot of political factions. The oppression of Rome is just unrelenting. The Jews are wanting, there's a lot of talk about revolt. And in the middle of this setting, you also have all these people coming to Christ, and yet you have a lot of opposition to that. You have people who don't want them to come to Christ, don't want them to trust Jesus, want them to keep practicing Judaism. And so in the middle of that, Paul steps in, and Paul is a firebrand. Paul speaks the truth. Paul calls people to an account. He's had interactions with James that maybe just didn't go as well as maybe James would have hoped or Paul would have hoped, but he's confronted them. And now what James says to him is, hey, I know you've come. We're happy to have you, but the word on the street about you is problematic. And you need to know this, Paul, that there's a rumor going around and the rumor is that you tell people have to have nothing to do with Moses and to abandon all the customs associated with Judaism. Now, here's the question. Is that true? The answer is no. Paul taught that the Mosaic law doesn't save anybody. You don't need to keep the law to be a Christian, that you're saved by grace through faith. Period. That's how it works. God saves people, not based on their performance, but based on falling at the feet of Jesus. That's how people come to Christ. That's Paul's message. And yet somebody has twisted this and is perpetuating a narrative about Paul that's not true. And the, the gossip about Paul is he's anti-Jewish. He's anti-law. He's an anti-Semite. This is the word that is filling all of the Reddit forums and Facebook pages. There are Facebook groups around it and Twitter threads. Paul is trending on Twitter in Jerusalem for being an anti-Semite. It's not true, but it's the word that has infiltrated the church. It's infiltrated. Pastor Paul is off theologically. Pastor Paul is wrong theologically. That's the word. And the church is bought into it, but it didn't start in the church. It actually started outside of the church with a group called the Judaizers. And the Judaizers taught the exact opposite of Paul in regard to the law. They said, Jesus is fine. You just need Jesus plus. You got to have Jesus plus the law. You got to have Jesus plus the works of the law. Jesus alone is not enough to save you. And the Judaizers see this as an opportunity, and so they start spreading this word that Paul is theologically errant, that Paul is an apostate, that Paul is not preaching the truth. And it's a lie. And I think we should pause right here and just note, where do lies come from? The devil. The guy in the front row knows. That's awesome. They come from the devil. Satan is the father of lies. So the, the, the Judaizer, Judaizers are perpetuating the lie, and the, these Jerusalem Christians have bought into the lie. The lie originated with the enemy. Satan is the liar. Satan is the one who birthed this lie. Satan was the one who's fanned this lie so that it spread all across the Jerusalem church. It's Satan. He's the one who's doing it. And here's the thing. Why would Satan spread this lie about Paul? Because one of Satan's most targeted and effective tactics is spreading lies about leaders and pastors and ministries. It's one of the things, actually, you can see this throughout the New Testament, that Satan loves to be the instigator of misinformation about people who are following Jesus. 
And he loves to because he knows if he can take out the leader, he can cause the church to fight one another and devour itself from the inside out, and the world will be in the gallery watching and eating their popcorn. So Paul knows that. James actually knows that. The Holy Spirit knows that, but Satan knows it. Satan knows if he can perpetuate a lie, if he can fan it into flame, that the church will go at one another. And so, this is what's happened in Jerusalem. James says, hey, they, they've been told about you. They've been told what you're like. They've been told what you're about, and they listen to it. Can I tell you that one of the first warnings in this passage is about what comes out of our mouth? I mean, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says, words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. You choose. We all have a choice. We have a choice about what we say. We also have a choice about what we listen to. And unfortunately, the Jerusalem church had bought into a line of thinking that had started in the pit of hell, had been perpetuated by people outside of the church, but now it's inside the church. So what are they going to do? What are they going to do? Well, go back to Acts 21. James says, do therefore what we tell you. So James is the leader here because he oversees the Jerusalem church. We have four men who are under a vow. What kind of vow are they under? They're under what number six calls a Nazarite vow. So Nazarites, you'll know Samson in the Old Testament, long hair, really strong. He was a Nazarite for life. John the Baptist had taken a Nazarite vow for life. But most Nazarite vows were 30, 60, or 90 days. And it was a vow of separation, of purifying. And so these four guys, they had taken this vow, and they tell Paul this, take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay their expenses. So they're at the end of this process. They're kind of in the final week of this vow. Maybe they've been doing it 30 or 60 days. And James says, you're going to pay their expenses, and here's the reason. So that they, i.e. the Christians in Jerusalem, may, oh, so that these guys may shave their heads, and thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. In other words, okay, Paul, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little damage control, okay? So James has kind of put on his PR hat, and he said, okay, the Jerusalem church, they bought into all this stuff about you. The best way to handle this is for you to do something Jewish. Now, here's why this is kind of ridiculous. It's kind of ridiculous because Paul is relate again and again, he's thoroughly Jewish. He had the best education a Jew could have. He's not anti-Jew. He's not an anti-Semite. He's not anti-Temple. He's not anti-Moses. He's pro-Jesus. Jesus was also a Jew. So, but James says, we need to do a little, we need to do something here to show them you're not who the Judaizers have told them you are, and the lie they believed is actually a lie so that you yourself live in observance of the law. So they want, he wants to show them this. So here's the question. Does Paul think that this plan is going to work based on what you know about Paul? We've, we've, we've studied Romans. We've walked through a lot of Scripture dealing with Paul. Does Paul, somebody said no. Yeah, no, I don't think he thinks this is going to work. Does Paul think that this is actually even a good idea? I doubt it. Probably not. Does Paul agree with the plan? Probably not. Probably not. But he's going to do it. He doesn't agree. He probably thinks it's a bad idea. He doesn't think it will work. So why would he do it? Two reasons. One, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul writes this, to the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law. He has to clarify that. That I might win those under the law. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. So Paul is intensely committed to seeing people come to Jesus. And he's willing to do anything short of sin to see people one. Hey, if it's not sin, I'm in. I'm willing to do whatever to see people respond to the message of the gospel. That's Paul. But I don't think this is actually Paul's primary reason for saying yes to James. I think Paul's primary reason for saying yes to James is that Paul understands the biblical principle of submitting to spiritual leadership. That 
Godly, godliness, in part, is demonstrated through an acknowledgement that God places leaders over people. He's placed leaders over me. He's placed leaders over you. At every campus, he's placed leaders in positions of authority to carry out his will. Paul's actually going to write about this in Romans chapter 13. But Paul understands there's a principle in play here that when we submit to godly leadership, there's a blessing. When we submit to godly leadership, God works through our submission to leadership to carry out His will and His plan for our life. If we, if we push away from that or we object to that, then we're stepping out of the bounds of what God has put into place. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in ver chapter 13. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Here's the thing. Paul knows that James will have to give an account before God for the Jerusalem church. It's his call. Ultimately, James is going to have to stand on this decision before God. Paul recognizes that. Paul's affirming that in agreeing to do what James has asked him to do. But listen to this. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. I just think that's funny. Um, let them do it with joy. Let the leader do it with joy. So Paul recognizes this is not the moment to go, okay, James, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh -uh. You're not a PR guy. That's not why you went to college. I know that's not what your degree was in. you like, you have a biblical studies degree, man. Like, let's not pretend. You know, Paul doesn't do that. Paul doesn't say, okay, clearly you haven't dealt with a lot of opposition, but I have. I'm the guy who's been like beaten with rods and all, a lot of stuff has happened to me. Uh, let me talk to you about opposition. He doesn't do that. Paul recognizes this isn't the time for a debate. This isn't the time to argue with James. This is the time to submit to godly leadership and say, God, okay, I'm going to trust you that you're working through James, that you're bringing about your good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I'm going to obey instead of argue. I'm going to trust instead of respond. Here's the thing. If you've read the chapter, you know some more stuff happens, but I think Paul in the back of his mind is thinking about what he's going to write, the principle that he's going to articulate in Ephesians chapter 4. What does he say in Ephesians 4? Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Paul recognizes, okay, if I can do anything to perpetuate unity, if I can do anything to help mend fences, if I can do anything to make the church stronger, tell me what it is, James, I'll do it. I don't know if that's where you're at. Or is that where you're at? Like, hey, God, if there's anything I can do to help make your family stronger, to help make us more effective, oh, I want to do what contributes to unity. That's where Paul is at. But if you've read the rest of the chapter, then you're probably not unaware that James's plan actually doesn't seem to work very well. We're going to see that in a second. You might say, well, it doesn't feel like it led to unity. So, if it doesn't feel like it led to unity, was it the right decision? Here's what I would tell you. Just because you do the right thing doesn't mean other people won't do the wrong thing. And your responsibility is to do the right thing before God. Your responsibility is not to go, God, I've walked this out and I don't think this will work. Your responsibility is to say, God, you said it, I'm going to do it. That settles it. God, I've heard your word loud and clear and I'm marching forward because my assignment is not from people. My assignment is from heaven and I will stand before you and give an account. And the success of my assignment won't be based on what people say. It'll be based on what God says. This is where Paul's at. This is why he steps into submission to leadership in a very sticky situation. In the middle of knowing that he's being misunderstood, he says, God, I'm going to trust you and walk into this. So we go back to Acts chapter 21, verse 27. A, uh, Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd. So he goes in, he does the deal. And they see him in the temple, they stir up the whole crowd, and they lay hands on him, crying out, man of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen him with Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Why is that a big deal? 
That's a big deal because in the temple, and I want to put up a picture of the temple. So you've got the Temple Mount. This would be what it looked like in first century Israel. And you have the court of the Gentiles. So this is where non-Jews could go. But Gentiles couldn't go everywhere. In fact, there was a little barricade right here, and it wrapped all the way around the court of the Jews, the inner inner part of the temple. And you were not allowed to cross that barrier, and if you did, there was a significant penalty. In fact, archaeologists doing a dig in 1871, they unearthed a sign that had been placed on that barricade. They unearthed another one in 1935, and both of the placards were identical. And the placards read this, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who is caught trespassing will bear the personal responsibility for his ensuing death. Whoa. So when the Romans had overtaken Palestine, they had revoked the Jews' ability to execute capital punishment. The Jews were not not able to carry out capital punishment without the Romans saying so. So you see this in Jesus. You know, they try Jesus, but they have to go to Pontius Pilate to get a death sentence carried out. They can't do it on their own. The only exception to that is if you cross this barricade. If you're a Gentile and cross this barricade, you're a dead person. And that execution could be carried out immediately. So they would grab that person and they would immediately stone them to death on the steps of the temple. So this is the seriousness of what is going on here. Now let's read next what happens. Go back to Acts chapter 21. Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together and they seized Paul and they dragged him out of the temple. At once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. Now go back to the map or the uh, temple mount real quick. This is the fort of Antonia. So there a Roman garrison was stationed here and the, there were about a thousand soldiers who lived within the Fort of Antonia, and they would watch from these towers what was happening on the Temple Mount. They were watching to make sure that no riots broke out, because if a Roman soldier allowed a riot to progress, they would ex- Rome would execute that soldier. They were so serious about keeping law and order and keeping the peace that they stationed men, soldiers up here, to watch the Temple Mount constantly. So, They see this riot breaking out and Paul being dragged out of the temple. Let's go back to the text. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them and they saw the trib... And when they saw the tribune, that being the Jews, and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Okay, they call a timeout because they know this isn't going to go well for us. And now we go back, go back to verse 33... Then the tribune came and arrested him and ordered him, that's Paul, to be bound in two chains. And he inquired who he was and what he had done. And some of the crowd were shouting one thing and the others were shouting another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers. So Paul is literally being held above their heads because of the violence of the crowd, for the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? So the guy's surprised. Why is he surprised? Why is he surprised that Paul might know Greek? It's not because he's a th- he thinks he's a Jew. Look at this. Are you not the Egyptian? Then, who recently stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of assassins out into the wilderness? You're like, what in the world is that? This, is, this story gets crazier and crazier. So, three years earlier, there was a group of assassins led by an Egyptian. And what they would do right now is the Feast of Pentecost that Paul has entered into. And during these feast times, what these assassins would do is they were called Sicarion. Dagger men. They would keep daggers strapped to their thigh or to their calf, and they would go into the crowd. And as the crowd was all gathered together, I mean, you're talking tens of thousands of people, they would go in and they would stab people, and then they would fade back into the crowd. 
So they were terrorists. And this had been happening continually. So in AD 54, the Romans hunted these guys down, drove them out into the wilderness, were able to kill 400 of them, but the other 3,600 escaped, including the leader. They all went underground. So what the Romans are still doing is they're looking for these guys. And they're seeing this riot, and their first thought is, Paul's an assassin. Paul's one of the, we, they, they caught the leader. Paul's now being questioned for crimes of terrorism at the hands of the Romans. It's interesting when you think about this passage. Paul comes, and when he comes to Jerusalem, he's come for a particular assignment. He's to preach the gospel, and he's actually delivering an offering. The Jews in Jerusalem had been under a severe famine, and so all these churches that Paul had planted had collected an offering, and Paul had brought this money to Jerusalem to help these Christians. And when he brings this offering, he tells the stories of what God has done, and as he lays this offering down, they say, hey, Paul, there's a lie that's been perpetuated about you. People think you're a really bad guy. They think you're off theologically. They don't really want you here. Okay, that's bad. So they say, hey, you need to do this vow thing, and you do the vow, and then it'll all get better. Paul does the vow, and a mob attacks him. Then as the mob is attacking him, the Romans rush in, bind him with two chains, and accuse him of being a terrorist. It's not going very well. So my question is this, because we're down to the end of the passage. We're going to make a few applications here. What do you do when it feels like things are going from bad to worse, what do you do when you're trying to do the right thing, but you're continually misunderstood? Look at this, verse 39. Paul replied, I am a Jew of Tarshish, of Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city, and I beg you, what is Paul gonna beg him? Let me go! <laughs> I'm not the guy, I'm not the assassin. I beg you to let me speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul was standing on the steps, Paul standing on the steps, motioned with his hands to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language. Now, next week, we're going to look at what Paul says in the middle of this situation. But today, I want to focus as we just spend this last minute or two looking at this on what Paul did. What did Paul do when he was misunderstood? What do you do when you're misunderstood? What guides, what are the principles that guide Paul through this entire story? First is this, Paul used opposition as an opportunity. He used opposition as an opportunity. Some of you know what this is like. At work, there are people who are so against you. There are people in your family and they're like, I can't believe you believe what you believe. Are you nuts? It just feels like opposition after opposition. Here's what I would just tell you. Could it be that God has allowed the opposition because it's actually an opportunity? That it's disguised as opposition, but Paul is right now standing in a crowd of tens of thousands of people, an opportunity he would have never had. You could hear a pin drop and he's got a moment to preach. Who knows? If it is not that God has allowed the opposition to create an opportunity for you to point people to Jesus, see the opposition as an opportunity. Second, stay on mission. Stay on mission. What do you notice about Paul? He never gets sidetracked from what he's ultimately there to do. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem to preach the gospel. Well, what if you're accused of being an assassin, Paul? Well, I'm still gonna preach the gospel. What if there are lies told about you and everybody thinks you're a false teacher? I'm still going to preach the gospel. Well, what if a mob tries to attack you and kill you? I'm still going to preach the gospel. Paul stayed on mission. I don't know what the specifics of your story are, but you got a mission from God. God's called you to reach people. God's called you to that workplace. God's called you to that neighborhood. Stay on mission. And finally, trust that God is at work. Trust that God is at work. Here's the thing, if Paul doesn't trust God is at work, then all his only alternative is to go, I've been surrendered to chaos. But he knows that's not true. He knows that God is at work. He knows that because in Acts chapter 20, what's happening to him was actually prophesied, that he was gonna be bound in chains. 
that he was gonna be arrested, he was gonna be mistreated. He knew this was gonna happen. So what do you think Paul is doing as he gathers his thoughts on these steps to preach to this hostile crowd? I envision him going back to the words of Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah said this, fear not. This is God talking, Isaiah writing, for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God and I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Aren't you thankful you can trust God? Aren't you thankful in the middle of opposition, you don't have to be afraid. He's with you. He's with you. So regardless of if you're misunderstood, if you're maligned, you're mistreated. You can face all of that knowing he will uphold you with his righteous right hand. Let's pray together. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.